On November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that changed my life. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Bible has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that's classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, you can actually travel, like Paul and John actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, talks about a natural body and a spirit body. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, he was picked up by his hair and carried from Babylon to Jerusalem in a vision. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. My point is, in your spirit body, you can experience the same things that you would in your physical body. And this is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. The only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or a vision. And uh, this happened. I was a Christian for 28 years when this happened in 1998. And uh, Job 7.14 says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can have a terrifying vision. Isaiah 21.2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. Now, uh, you might say, Bill, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to hell. Why do I need to hear about hell? Three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. Number two, it'll cause us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord, not live compromised and play around with sin. Mark 9, 47, Jesus said, if your eye offends thee, the word offend means causes you to sin. He said, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than into hell fire. And Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? Simply, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 17 said, the fear of the Lord is to read his word daily and to obey his word daily. And Proverbs 8, 13 says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So that's, that would show that you fear the Lord. And understanding the severity of hell will cause you to hate every evil work. You will not want to play around with sin and take any chance of going to this horrible place. And then number three, it gives us all a passion for the lost, a desire to want to witness. You know, Bill Bright said only 2% of Christians even bother to witness. But see, when you see how severe it is, you'll think, I didn't know it was this bad. I've got to warn my family. I've got to pray more diligently. And maybe you'll get on your knees now and you'll pray and you'll fast for your family or your friends and so forth because you'll think they cannot go to this place. Uh, I claim their salvations. Uh, Father, give them a dream or a vision. I ask you, Lord, send labors across their path. You will pay, pray fervently when you understand how severe hell is. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, that scripture is talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, but commentaries also point out that he was also talking about judgment and hell in general. So when you understand judgment and hell in general, you will be more persuasive with men, okay? So that's why it's important for us as Christians to hear about hell. Now, my wife and I went to a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual about the night. I had never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I've never had a vision before. We came home from this prayer meeting like any other normal night. I went to bed, my wife and I, and I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And I was walking through our living room. And something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body. I saw my body fall to the floor. And I began tumbling down this long tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter. And I landed on an actual stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough-hewn stone walls, bars, stinking, filthy, dirty prison, but like a dungeon. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7.27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17.16, they shall go down to the bars of the pit. 
Jonah 2.6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. The Tyndale, the New International, and many other commentaries point out that Jonah himself was at the gates of hell and that it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's where I first found myself, face down on the floor. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was like being in a blast furnace. I wondered, how could it be alive in this horrible heat? And so my reaction was, I just wanted to get up and run out of this prison cell. But I noticed I had no physical strength. I tried to move, and it took so much effort just to move. I thought, what is wrong with my body? But Isaiah 14, 9, and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. So if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, it's a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. So it's literal. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. Well, I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts in this cell, uh, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, a huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long, and these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. There's even scripture for that, Genesis 6, 4, Deuteronomy 3, 11. Some others indicate that these demons can have tremendous size, and they were blaspheming and cursing God. They had an extreme hatred for God. But we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, and some others. And then they directed the hatred they had for God, they directed it towards me. I wondered why, what have I done to them? But the one demon picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell. Demons have tremendous strength and you have none. I hit the wall of this prison cell, I collapsed on the floor, I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. Now, maybe a spirit doesn't have bones, but it sure felt that way. But I have to explain one thing. I understood that most of the pain was being blocked. I didn't understand then, but on the way back, the Lord explained to me that he blocked most of the pain that I would have felt. Uh, but he did allow me to feel a small amount of pain so I could relate to people that it's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real, literal pain you're going to feel in hell. The mountain I felt was enough. Then this other demon grabbed me, picked me up, and dug its claws into my chest and just tore the flesh open. I thought, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. And I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, that the, Jesus talked about the rich man in hell. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes to lift. He had a tongue. So you have a body in hell, but it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed about the body, there was no blood or water coming from the wound. It was just all dry. But Leviticus 17.11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9.11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. But see, Psalms 103.17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive the benefit of mercy. About this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see. But then he withdrew his light, and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, you cannot see the hand in front of your face. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. Psalms 88, 6, Psalms 143, 3, and many other verses talk about darkness. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel it. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Because it's so evil and so dark, I mean, it just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. And you're in absolute terror. I was taken out of this prison cell. Uh, I didn't know what took me, but I was taken out of the cell and placed over next to this large, large raging pit of fire. 
This pit was about a mile across, like a huge hole in the ground, with flames raging high up into this open cavern. And it wasn't metaphorical or allegorical flames. I felt the heat, I saw the fire, but more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11:6 6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, the angels shall sever the wicked from the just, cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Isaiah 33, 12 says, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many scriptures on the fire of hell. But this is where I could first see people. I could just see through the flames. It's so dark in hell, the light doesn't travel. But I could see through it, and I could see the outlines of people. And there were literally thousands of people inside this pit burning. And most of us in life here have never seen a person on fire. And it is the most horrendous sight. You cannot distinguish a man from a woman. They just look like skeletons. And the screams were so loud and deafening. You want to escape the screams, but you can't. But see, Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mind, no peace of any kind. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, My people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not his people, so you don't derive the benefit of even quiet. Now, I... I descended to get there, I ascended when I left, so I understood that I was down deep in the earth. And there's 49 scriptures that point where the current hell is. Sheol is the Hebrew word, Hades is the Greek word. But I'll just give you two. Ezekiel 26, 20, and Numbers 16, 32, and 33. It's very clear it's down deep in the earth, but I understood that. I also understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers the lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That infers the less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is, there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is far worse than your mind can even conceive. Now, I thought about my wife up on the earth, and I just wanted to say goodbye to her, but I knew I would never have that opportunity. See, Job 7.9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. When you're there, you understand you're not going to get out. And you don't realize how tormenting of a thought that is to have no finality with your family because they don't know that you still exist. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. And to not be able to say goodbye, I could never tell her I love her. I could never hold her. Not even say goodbye. That thought is tormenting you for all eternity. I also, I wanted to talk to a person. I was so desirous to just talk to a person. But see, those people in the pit, they're all kept at a distance from each other. And so you're isolated. You're all by yourself. You have no conversation ever again. And you have no purpose whatsoever. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14, Deuteronomy 32, 26, Psalms 109, 15, all explain that you're forgotten. And that's an awful thing, that you understand nobody on the earth has given you a thought. I mean, think about it. Do you think about anybody in hell? No, right? Even if you go to a funeral today, no matter what the religion, they usually say, well, they've gone to a better place. Yet that's not the case. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many are going to hell and few are going to heaven. You know, so you're forgotten. Uh, The stench in hell, the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors, worse than any open sewer, anything bad you can ever imagine, it's a thousand times worse than that. But remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits in Mark 9.25. Demons have a disgusting, foul, decaying odor to them. Also, the smell of burning flesh. And on top of that, 
you're breathing in sulfur. And, you know, if you go to Hawaii to the volcanoes, uh, the volcano there, the, the, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity coming out of the volcano, it's called sulfur dioxide. If you breathe it, it will kill you. It's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And there were brimstones all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. You have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. And I'll have to demonstrate to you, this is how you breathe in hell. It was like... <coughs> that was as much air as you could get. At any moment, you feel like you're going to suffocate. There's not enough oxygen. But see, Isaiah 42.5 says, The Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth, you're down deep beneath the earth. God is very specific with his word. Uh, you need to sleep in hell, but you never get to go to sleep. Now, I was only there 23 minutes, but I felt as if I was there 23 weeks without sleeping. And if you, know, if you ever stay up for one or two nights, just try to stay up for two nights and don't go to sleep. You can't really function. You're just a wreck after two days. But in hell, it gets progressively worse. You never get to go to sleep. See, Revelation 14, 10, and 11 says, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, no rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind, because Isaiah 57, 20 says, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving, right? Can't rest. Well, you can't rest in hell either. But see, rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127.2 said, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. Well, you're not his beloved there. So you don't derive the benefit of sleep. Now, it's a place of confusion. Jeremiah 20.11, Isaiah 45.16 mention a land of everlasting confusion. You know how we like things in order in life, right? Orderly. Hell is the antithesis. Hectic. Crazy, chaotic, nothing makes any sense. Job 10.22 mentions a land without any order. And uh, so you're just enduring all that for all eternity. Now I was standing next to this pit of fire and I was beneath a tunnel, a cavern, walls that ascended upward. And all along the cavern walls were demons. Some were only two and three feet tall, twisted, deformed, and grotesque. Demons have no symmetry to their body. Like we're symmetrical, everything's even. One leg was bigger than the other, one foot bigger than the other, one arm longer than the other, but twisted and deformed and reptilish in appearance. And some were 12 and 13 feet tall. There were snakes crawling all over everything. And I noticed I was standing on a bed of maggots. Maggots were everywhere. But remember, Jesus said, where their worm dies not. And the fire is not quenched. And Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original. It's the word maggot. And that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not. See, if a dead animal is uh, being eaten by maggots, I never knew this, but after they consume the flesh, the maggots will die. I never realized that. But that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24.20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? You're hungry. You never get to eat. You have the feeling of hunger for all eternity. Thirsty. Remember the rich man Jesus talked about in Luke 16. It wasn't a parable. It was a true story. And, you know, if I was to give you a drop of water, one drop, that wouldn't suffice, would it? You wouldn't value one drop. But in hell you would. you do anything to get that one drop of water. You're so thirsty. Just think that rich man Jesus talked about, that was 2,000 years ago. He's still longing for that one drop that he'll never get. The fear level that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything any of us have ever experienced. And I'm going to share with you an experience I had so you can try to uh, relate or get the idea of how much fear you have to endure in hell. See, fear has torment, the Bible says. And when I was 17, I used to surf a lot. And we were surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida. About 100 guys out that day. It was a big day. And in Florida at Cocoa Beach, when it's big, it breaks out about a quarter to a half a mile out. 
So you're far off the beach. And we were out there, um, and the guy next to me suddenly got his leg torn off. Sharks. Blood was all over the water. Now a whole bunch of sharks came. So I got up on my knees on my board to get my legs out of the water. I was on a nine-foot board at the time, and my buddy was on his board, and a shark passed by, and he was longer than my board, and he opened his mouth, and their teeth are huge. And you just feel so helpless, these powerful creatures. And then the shark came back, and he bit my board right in half. And, you know, and so I'm in the water swimming. My buddy's knocked off his board, and all these other guys are trying to scramble to get to the beach. And my buddy looks at me and says, Bill, I guess we're dead. And then the shark came back, and it was a tiger shark. I saw the stripes on it. If you know anything about sharks, tiger sharks are really vicious. They eat anything. And the shark came back, grabbed my leg, and pulled me down under the water. Now, you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. I mean, that's, it's pretty fearful. That fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register in hell. But see, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. And this terror lasts for all eternity. It's not going away. But you know, a miracle happened that day. That shark opened his mouth, and not only let me go, I expected my leg to be shredded, right, when they grabbed me. I didn't have a mark in my leg. That's impossible. God was looking out for me then. And, you know, I, I was not a Christian then, but I got saved immediately after that. <laughs> I did. I knew that. But I was God. And we made it to the beach, and I thought, Lord, you did that for me. Now, I didn't understand salvation yet. Somebody explained it to me. I needed to repent and receive Jesus. I just knew that was God, and I wanted to get to know him. And that's where it started. I got saved at 17 years old. I've been saved for 52 years now, and God's been so good to me. You know, he's really blessed my life, and, and we serve a good God, amen? That's right. So I, as I was... Um, I just want to take a moment and give you some scripture. I know I've been giving you scripture, but that's what's important for you to believe. Not my experience. It doesn't matter if you believe me. But you, know, you might say, Bill, come on, being tormented by demons, and aren't you exaggerating hell? No, that's what the Bible says. That's not my idea. So can you bear with me for about two minutes while I give you scripture about being tormented in hell? Is that okay? Okay. Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with you. Psalms 50, verse 22, you that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. Matthew 24, 51, I will cut him in pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Psalms 116, 3, the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19. For what good is a day of the Lord to you, judgment day? It'll be darkness, and as a man fled from a lion, and a bear met him. Job 33, 22. His soul draws near to the pit, and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141, 7. Their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49, 14. Their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. Psalms 32.10, many sorrow shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78.49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. Deuteronomy 32.22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon thee with poison of serpents of the dust. Matthew twenty two thirteen. bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 15, 6, if a man abide not in me, just as men gather branches that are withered, they are thrown into the fire and are burned. Luke 12, 4 and 5, don't fear him who is after he killed the body as no more he can do. Fear him who is after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say to you, fear him. Um, I, I just, um, I'm going to give you a few more. Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 
in Matthew 23, 33, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's Jesus speaking. And one more verse, Psalm 74, 20 says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Full of the habitations of cruelty. The word cruelty, look it up in the Strong's Concordance, number 2555. It's the word Hamas. We've heard that word before, right? The terrorist group, Hamas. The word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. Now you say, Bill, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, he said why. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this place. He prepared it for the devil. But he used the same word in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven. The word prepare means make ready. So he's preparing hell for the devil, heaven for us. But what he did in the preparation was, you see, James 1.17 says every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. The fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good we enjoy comes from God. It's not automatic. So what he did in the preparation was he simply withdrew his goodness or his attributes. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1.5 said God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1.4 said God is life. There's already hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said, God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says, the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said, it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says, water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says, he is the prince of peace. So if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. So if you're a person in life that says, you know what, I don't want anything to do with God. Well, fine, there's a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. Can you see that? Other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the scripture it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. Your choice. You know, when people look at the trees, the mountains, the ocean, they say, oh, isn't Mother Nature wonderful? No, that's not Mother Nature. That's Father God that provided all that good in us. Amen? Psalms 33, 5 says the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We get to enjoy his goodness while we're here in life, but if you deny him, you won't get to enjoy his goodness. Now, as I was looking at all this horror, something began lifting me up this tunnel. And as I was being raised up this tunnel, I was terrified in this pitch black darkness, demons terrorizing people and burning. And, but suddenly in this bright light, this bright light appeared. Now I knew immediately who it was. When Jesus shows up, there's no question in your mind who it is. I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a pure, bright, holy light. But it was not like any light I've ever seen. It was pure. And it was so bright. But I could see his outline. And I just said, Jesus. And he said two words. I am. When he said I am, I went out. I don't know if I died or passed out. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. And after time, he touched me, and I was at his feet. And when I came to, when he touched me, it hit, hit me so strongly. Even though I'd been a Christian for 28 years at that point, I realized that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross... I would be in that horrible place for all eternity. I was so grateful for what he did and for the cross. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Oh, thank you. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to ask him anything. But after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind. And he would answer my thoughts. See, Psalms 139, 2 says, he answers our thoughts afar off. I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? 
He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe that hell exists. That statement surprised me. I thought all Christians believe in hell, but we have found out since that many do not. They believe in annihilationism. That's a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus. Or universalism, another false teaching that says everybody gets saved. Or soul sleep, you just go to sleep. These are all false teachings. And uh, so he wanted me to share with people. I'm just a signpost to point people to the scripture and believe the scripture. I said, Lord, Why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. See, John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. See, demons hate God, but they can't hurt him, but they can hurt his creation. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We serve a good God that came to give us life. The evil we see in life, the destruction, sickness, disease, poverty, all that comes from the demonic realm. We serve a good God. Amen? That's right. I said, Lord, why did you pick me? But he never gave me an answer. So I have no idea. I was not a Billy Graham. I was just a real estate broker going to work every day like the rest of us. I actually felt like I almost wanted to say to the Lord, Lord, you made a mistake. I'm the wrong guy. But the word mistake and God don't seem to go too well together. So, <laughs> But I said, to, I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. That's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. But I have to admit, I complained. Now, I told my best friend, and uh, that's all. I didn't want to tell anybody else. And he asked me to come to his Bible study. I went reluctantly three months later. Well, there were pastors there, and they started inviting me to come to their churches. Well, it spread from there. So for the next seven years, there was no book then, but we were invited for seven years to travel and We paid our own way everywhere we went around the country. We never took one penny from anybody. Uh, I had a real estate business. I made a lot of money. I didn't need it. But I didn't want anybody to say he's doing it for the money. So we did that for seven years. And I complained, though, because I'm a conservative person by nature. I didn't want to be identified with someone that says they've been to hell. In my mind, I pictured someone uh, with wild hair on a street corner with a wooden sign, repent or burn, you know. I mean, that's what I envisioned. I thought, that's not me. I'm not getting a part of that. And I complained to the Lord for seven years. Uh, I went, but I still complained. And he said to me one day, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Man, that convicted me. I felt so bad. I thought, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. You know, now it doesn't matter if I feel uncomfortable. Because if one person can come to the light of the scripture and avoid this horrible place, then it's worth any uncomfortableness I could ever feel. Right? You know, and sometimes God pulls us out of our comfort zone. But if we'll be obedient, we'll become comfortable. And you know, God's given us all a job to do. There's no big shots with God. We all need each other. And whatever God's called you to do, I just encourage you to do it with all your might. Because we don't have a lot of time. Now, I said to the Lord, why, Lord, why didn't I know you? You remember I explained? No, maybe I didn't explain it to you. Uh, see, God hid it from my mind that I was a Christian. He blocked that from my mind. You say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary point out, quote, they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their mind. Other examples of this are in John 20, 14, Luke 18, 34, Daniel 4, 34, 2 Kings 4, 27, all places where God hid it from their mind, and he hid it from my mind for this reason. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here, right? As a Christian, we know our destiny is heaven. I would have known that. But he wanted me to feel what they feel. Hopelessness. See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. 
But see, none of us in life can really imagine what it's like to be hopeless. Because even if your situation is so dire, so painful, you understand you can die to get out of the pain. Right? You know that. But in hell, you understand you're never going to escape the pain. A hundred million years will go by and it's still day one. There's no one to come rescue you. I just want that to sink into you for a minute to try to even grasp that you understand you'll never get out. Never. That's the worst part of hell. And that's what the Lord wanted me to feel so I could convey to people the urgency to accept him. Don't put it off. Because like I said, one second after you die, you don't get a second chance. As we were coming up this tunnel, we were in like a whirlwind tunnel coming out of hell. There's scripture for that, but I'm going to keep moving. And we went above the earth. We came out and above the earth. And I looked back and I was above the earth like an astronaut would be out in space. It was so amazing to see the earth from space and just hung on nothing. As Job 26, 7 says, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. It was like, what's holding it up? What's making it turn so perfectly at 1,000 miles an hour and not varying at all? All these thoughts I was thinking, and I could grasp a little bit more than we can here how big the universe is, how big a God we serve, and he's in control of every star, the billions and trillions of them. And he said he has a name for every one of them. Can you imagine a name for, and there's countless stars. And all, he knows every thought in our mind at every moment. I was thinking about all that, but then he had me turn around and look at that tunnel we just came out of. And people were falling one after another, after another, after another, back down in the hell. And he allowed me to feel just a piece of his heart, the anguish he feels for a soul falling into hell. And I couldn't stand it. I said, Lord, stop. I, I can't take that much anguish. And he just let me feel a little bit. But see, Ephesians 3.19 says, his love passes knowledge. He loves us far more than you can possibly imagine and doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He's trying to keep people out of hell. And that was probably the most precious thing about this experience I had was just feeling a piece of God's heart, the love he has for every single person. Now you say, Bill, but, you know, how can a loving God send a good person to hell if he's so loving? Well, God, number one, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But number two, if you're going to go by the standard of good and think, you know, my, hey, my neighbor's good. Uh, how can God send a good person to hell? See, you, he, your neighbor or you might be good compared to your standards. But if you're going to compare, use good, you have to compare to God's standard. And James 2.10 says, uh, if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. If we just lie once, if we have one, if we steal one thing, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, no thief will inherit heaven. If we have one lustful thought, Jesus said, that's the same as committing adultery. No adulterer will inherit heaven. Well, that's just three of the Ten Commandments. So if we're going to be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? We'd all be guilty, Right? There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If you have one foolish thought your entire life, that would exclude you from heaven. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So none of us can stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me in. He's going to say, no, not according to my standard. Matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? That's right. But you might not be convinced yet. You might be a, like a secular radio talk show host I was on with. It was syndicated across America. Uh, and they said, Bill, watch your back with this guy. He does not like Christians. He'll spit you off the air in a minute. And so I went on the air, and the first thing he said was, okay, Christian, don't you quote one Bible verse to me on my airwaves. You got that? I don't want to hear none of that Bible stuff on my airwaves. I said, okay. He said, I submit to you that you Christians are unreasonable because you don't consider my viewpoint. My viewpoint is just as valid as yours, and I'm a good person. And I should be let into heaven, and if your God does let me into heaven, he's actually guilty of a hate crime. What he said? He goes, so what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? 
well, what do you say? You're live on the air. And I thought, Lord, what do I say? I can't give scripture. And the Lord gave me an analogy. Thank God. And I said, okay, you think you're a good person. You should go to heaven. I said, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country. You knocked on their door and you said, uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? You don't have a relationship with them. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as the son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You have no relationship with him. I said, see, God offered to be your father throughout your whole life, but you pushed him away. You said, no, I don't want you. I don't want you to be my father. Not interested. See, God is your creator. He's not your father to invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Now you have the privilege of living at his house. So I said, that's unreasonable for you to expect to live at someone's house that you don't even know. He said, whoa, you can fight back. <laughs> he was a tough New Jersey guy. You know, I like those people, New, New York and New Jersey. They're tough, bottom line, don't pull any punches. I like that. And, uh, but I was giving him just coming back against him. So he says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. He said, I think all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. I said, well, let me give you another analogy, which God gave me on the spot. And I said, say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I think I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Well, you're going to tell me, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. Well, the same thing. God gives us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives. Yeah. All we have to do is follow his clear directions and we will get there. That's not narrow-minded. That's specific. He's given us specific, clear directions on how to get to his house. He's not trying to keep us out. Amen? You know, some people think that we're, God's up there arbitrarily saying, well, this one goes to heaven and this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically on the road to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 says we're condemned already because we're born in sin, Psalms 51, 2. So that's different than being sent there. We're already going there. That's why Jesus came and planted that cross in the middle of that road. So all we have to do is repent, ask forgiveness of our sin, and he'll take us off that road. Right? It's just that simple. He says, well, can't God overlook my sin? I mean, you know, I don't kill anybody. That's the other misconception. If you don't kill somebody, you know, you're good enough for heaven. I said, no, God cannot overlook our sins for two reasons. Number one, he's a just judge. And a good judge in our land would not be considered good if he let the criminal go free, right? The crime has to be punished. Our sin has to be punished. But Jesus took that punishment for us if we would trust in what he did on the cross and repent of our sins. And he said I, and that the second reason that God cannot overlook our sins is because Nahum 1.5 and uh, Hebrews 12.29 said that God is a consuming fire. And Nahum 1.5 says that all of us would be consumed at his presence. So in other words, see, his nature is different than ours. If I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and the fire burned my hand, I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn my hand? That was mean of that fire. I wouldn't say that, would I? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. My hand and fire are not compatible. Well, neither is a holy God and sinful man compatible. So if we showed up in his presence the way we are, we'd be consumed. So he has to give us a new nature, a new heart, a new spirit. How can that happen? Only one way. If someone came and lived the perfect life and never sinned once, that's Jesus Christ. And he stands before the Father and says, I've never sinned. I'm going to take their sin upon me and I'm going to wash it away with my blood. If they would trust in me, not their works, Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. If we would trust in the work of the cross, he considers our trust as if we were righteous. Isn't that amazing? He considers our trust as if we were righteous. So now he washes away our sins. We can stand before holy God as if we've never sinned 
because he's taken care of our sin, and now God gives us that new nature that's compatible with his. Isn't that an amazing plan that God came up with? See, some people complain and say, I don't like this one-way business you Christians have. You ought to be grateful there is a way. He made a way where there was none. Quit complaining. It's just like if you went to a doctor and you had a disease, and the doctor said, you know, there's only one cure for this disease. This, this pill is the only cure. And you say, doctor, I'm offended that there's only one way. There should be more than one way. I'm not going to take the pill. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? Well, mankind has a fatal disease. It's called sin. And there is only one cure, Jesus Christ. So take the pill, you know. So that's the, the bottom line. Thank God he made a way where there was no way. That's right. You know, this is the clear directions to heaven. John 3.36 says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Abide means take up residency. So the, his wrath ab abides on that person for all eternity. How do you know the son? Just two verses. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. What does repent mean? That means to have a humble heart and admit, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. But I agree to turn away from sin and follow Jesus. That's what repent means, to turn away from sin and follow Jesus. Now, on your own, you can't resist sin. But when you get born again, God gives us a new nature, and he gives us the grace or the ability to say no to sin. Right now, you just have to be willing to turn away from sin. And Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe it in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You want to live at his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. Now, if you say, Bill, I just don't believe that. Well, then I have a verse for you. Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So he just warned you, if you don't believe my word, you will end up in the lake of fire. Now you can see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you. Because people say, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe Jesus is the only way. Their own words send them to hell, not God. He's trying to keep them out. Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book, and he's going to look to see if our names are in his book. You know, my neighbor was a tough Marine, and he was not afraid of anything. He was an atheist. We found out he was dying. He was in a hospital. My wife and I went to see him. We went, and he's lying in the bed. He looked terrible, and he said, he grabbed my hand. He says, Bill, you know, I'm, I've never been afraid of anything. But he said, I was slipping out of my body last night. I was on my way to hell. I was never so terrified in my life. He said, it was so dark. I could feel heat. I was so terrified. How do I stay out of this place, Bill? What do I do? Now, this is a man that was a tough Marine, atheist, would never hear about God. But he just got a glimpse of heading to hell. He wasn't even there yet. And he was terrified. Well, we led him to the Lord, and he got saved. But that's my point. He wasn't even there, and that's terrified him. This is a place you don't want to go to. You know, when the Titanic set sail, there were all different people on that ship, all different religions, all different walks of life, and all different beliefs, and there were three classes of people, the lower, the middle, and the upper class. But the, at the White Star Line office, when the ship went down, at the White Star Line office in Liverpool, England, they had two signs posted, and the people would wait anxiously each day as a man would come out and write their relative's name down on one of the signs. One sign said, known to be saved. The other sign said, known to be lost. Now, when the ship left, there were all different beliefs, all different walks of life, all different religions, and three classes of people. But in the end, there's only two. You're either saved or you're lost. And it's a person's own choice. So my question for you today is, do you know if your name is written in his book? Are you certain? You need to be certain of this one. You know, we all make mistakes in life, but you don't want to make this one. 
And whether you believe it or not, your soul is eternal. You will spend it in one place or the other. And heaven is not our default destination. We need to make a purposeful act on our part and repent and receive Jesus. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just going to ask you here, if you're not certain, you can be certain today. And please don't leave here and think, you know, I can think about this later. Because if you leave, your heart grows harder and it's more difficult to reach you. And you don't know that you'll have tomorrow. Or you might be here and you know better, you haven't been living right for God. You've been compromised in your lifestyle. Well, you can get it right today with God. There's nothing better than serving God and being in His perfect will because He wants to bless your life. So I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand if you're not certain if your name's in His book or if you want to get your life right with God today. Now, it's your choice. This is your opportunity. One, two, three. Slip up your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hands. Thank you for your honesty. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Most of us have done this. Also, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. You want to make sure he sees that hand. I'm going to ask everybody to stand to their feet. And I'm going to challenge each person that raised their hand. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come down to the front. I know it takes some guts to do this. But you know, it shows God. You're, you mean business. You're not doing this half-heartedly. So just come down to the front. Most of us have done this. Nothing to be embarrassed about. But just come down. Give us the privilege of praying for you. Also, you'll never forget this time at the altar. It does something to you. It, it will change you. Just make your way down. Anybody that raised their hand or wants to get their life right with God, just come down to the front. Make your way down. We're just going to wait another 30 seconds or so. If there's anybody else, I just want to make sure everybody in this room goes to heaven. There's no reason you have to go to hell. And you don't have to clean yourself up. Some people think, you know, I got to get my act right before I come to God. No, you don't. You just come as you are. He'll clean you up. Anybody else? All right. Why don't you guys all come this way towards the center? Everybody move this way. All right, we're going to say a prayer. It's going to come from your own heart. Maybe some of you, this is the first time you're committing to the Lord. Maybe you're just recommitting your life. But whatever, we're going to say this prayer, and it will change your life. It's going to come from your heart, but just repeat after me. Okay? You ready? It's the most important decision you could ever make and the best decision you could ever make. We can all say this together. Anybody else, in the last second, make your way down right now. All right, let's say this. You guys raise your hands in the front. Just lift up your hands. It's like an act of surrender, okay? Don't raise your hands and just, it's like you're surrendering your life to God. Say, dear God in heaven, I know that I've sinned and I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, that he was crucified died and was buried but rose again and lives forevermore I ask you to forgive me I'm sorry I repent 
come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. Fill me with your Spirit, and I will serve you all the days of my life. I now confess I'm a born-again Christian going to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes. Praise God.